activate. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. The blasphemy, this is what I really want to focus on, is because that is, um, that is really what drives uh, the world today. It's just an act of blasphemy against God and against his people. Uh, religion is, for the most part, just people uh, that have a ritual or a moral compass that's defined by form and ceremony. Listen to what I just said. For most people, religion is nothing more than a ritual or a moral compass defined by form and ceremony. That's all it is to them. It's, it's, it's something, it's an act that you go through uh, that makes you feel a little better about yourself, feel like you're part of something, maybe part of a community, and it is, it's, it's, it's all about the form and the ceremony. And if you violate that, then you have essentially offended the people, and sometimes they'll even say, well, that's offensive to God. But we've all been in churches where form and ceremony is everything. It's so important. Uh, it's, it's, it has to be done this way. Uh, I was, when I was serving at a, at a, at a church in Florida, there was, a, there was a lady in the church who was so angry with me because she wanted us to sing the doxology every Sunday. And she would write me notes, and I mean, she, she would say things, you know, we're Baptists, we should sing the doxology every Sunday. And I told her one time, it was written by Methodists. I, I don't know if it was or not, but you know, it felt good to say it. Uh, but she was really insistent on that. She was really upset that we didn't sing the doxology every Sunday. <laughs> and one day, uh, we had we were in this outer corridor, and as, as people left, you know, we would stand, I called it, you know, the, the um, uh, well, I won't tell you what I called it, but we would shake people's hands as they came through. It's a critic's line is really what it is. Um, and you're shaking people's hands, and, you know, and they're always saying nice things, you know, nice sermon, nice sermon, nice sermon, you know, yeah, I fine, see ya. Um, and so um, she, that was visiting with some people who were, uh, that were guests that day. In fact, there were two sets of two different families, and we're visiting and we're chatting. Hi, how are you? You know, it's nice to meet you. Where are you from? Da 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 da, and so forth and so on. And she came up right in the middle of that. I mean, right when I'm talking to visitors, and she says, "I'm going to have your job," and I said, "You can have it. <laughs> it's okay with me. I, you know, you know." You want me to take off a robe? I mean, should I give it? You know, what do you want? How do I sign? Oh, wait, let's sign. Let's sign a contract on this one. You know, and these these people that were visiting were like, "What? Who's this nut?" You know, um, people are so focused sometimes on form and ceremony. Oh, if we don't do this, then we've really violated. You know, what 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 we believe and who we are as a religion, and it's all about form and ceremony. Well, the truth of the matter is. The Pharisees and Sadducees were all about form and ceremony. That was what defined them, and that's what they believed defined their religion. They never, never, notice in all of these stories, in all of the Gospels, read the story of the trials and everything and what they came up with. They never used scriptural truth to judge Jesus. Not once. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were so intent on following the law, Mosaic law, never used it never once used it. They used their own laws. You know, the Pharisees were really good about adding law to law. You know, you can't walk so many steps, you know, on a, on a Sabbath because, you know, that's, that's work on the Sabbath. And they had laws on laws. They've, they went into that, but they never went into the Scripture and defined and, and followed uh, Scripture principles to come up with a charge for Jesus. Uh, it's ironic that they were... Um, so committed to their form and ceremony and yet so ignorant of the truth that they professed to follow. Um, when they determined that they were not able to really come up with any kind of scriptural basis for charging Jesus, and that happened very, very quickly, then they resorted to their own sanctimonious sense of right, regardless of the scriptural truths that they pretended to follow. So they just tossed truth out the window. They just took what they 
said that they believed, they believed the Mosaic law, and they followed it to the letter. That was, that was certainly the Sadducees anyway. And they just decided that, well, we can't, we can't abide by that. That doesn't apply here. And so they came up with their own charges and their own concept of truth. They were the ultimate example of obeying the word of God when it behooved them, but ignoring truth when it didn't justify their evil ways. And that is blasphemy. That is true blasphemy. The very ones that were accusing Jesus of blasphemy were the most blasphemous because they were pretending to follow Mosaic law, pretending to follow scriptural truth and principle, but because they couldn't use it to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish, they ignored it and came up with their own concept of truth. We're seeing the same thing today. We're seeing that same thing continue today. People who claim the name of the Lord and yet ignore scriptural truth. That's very, very dangerous. We're seeing it all the way from some people within the church to political authorities who, who claim to be believers. I'm deeply concerned in what I see in a number of Christian churches who are so focused on following signs and wonders that they're ignoring the truth that's, that is the foundation for all of that. And they say, oh, we're following the word, but they're not following the word. They're following what their leaders are saying in visions and, and what their leaders are coming up with. Instead of being faithful to the true word of God, they're faithful to the word of their leader. That's so dangerous. Even though they're doing that and saying that in the name of the Lord. Even though they call themselves Christians and believe you know, in, in the, the redemption of Jesus Christ, they're not really following the word. They're following their leaders. Well, Romans 1, it's interesting that Romans chapter 1 <coughs> talks about people who do that. Now, Romans 1, starting with verse 28, is on the, on the back end of a discussion about people uh, who burn for each other and, and homosexuality and that sort of thing. But what Paul does, starting with verse 28, he kind of encompasses it all. He says, look, this is a symptom. He said, well, people who do this, it's a symptom it's a symptom of a deeper issue, of a deeper problem. And he picks that up with verse 28 in Romans chapter 1, and he says this, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. It wasn't that God made them do that. He just said, fine, that's the way you're going to be. That's the way you're going to act. Go for it. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. By the way, if you ever want to, if you want to get into Scripture memory, memorize Romans 1.31. That, uh, and somebody says, what's your favorite verse? You say, oh, I, I love Romans 131. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. People will look at you funny, but, you know, you've quoted Scripture. Um, this whole, I know, it was just a parenthesis. This whole point, what I'm trying to make is that what Paul was teaching here in Romans was that what motivates people is, is what drives them because they're not following God. So something is going to motivate you. There is going to be something that motivates you. Every person is motivated by something. And so what is it that motivates you? Is it your love and passion for God? Or if it isn't, then you risk falling into this category where you begin, driven, you begin to be driven by things that don't seem to be that big of a deal, like covetousness, you know, things that I want. I, I want this, I want that, I, I need to have this. That's covetousness. And then it, then it begins to move into other things, and, and uh, envy, and, and uh, even murder in some cases, and murder being, being something that we say, well, I've, I've never done something like that. But that's just part of that life attitude, that I can do this and get away with this because this is what I think is right. 
You see, I don't know of anybody who commits murder thinking that they're doing, that this is the absolute worst wrong thing. They usually justify it for some reason or other. And uh, strife, deceit, you know, oh yeah, they're a little deceptive, you know, they don't, some of their business practices are a little questionable. That's the foundation that I'm talking about. And if you start living your life on any of these, on any of these foundations, then you are basically acquiescing to the other elements, and you begin embracing some of these other elements. And verse 32 then goes on to say, though they know God's righteous decree. Well, who knows God's righteous decree? People have been exposed to the truth. And in many of these people are people who are in the church. They have been exposed to the truth. They know what the truth is. They know what the Word of God is. They, they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, separation from God. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man. You have no excuse, every one of you who judges. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was 